Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. And today I'm joined by Austin Suggs from the Gospel Simplicity Channel. Austin is Protestant, but for the past few months, maybe more than a year, I've, see, I've seen him add a lot of videos to his channel showing a very honest investigation of Catholicism, orthodoxy, and really the essential doctrines that divide Christians. So I've been really impressed with his spiritual journey, uh, with his honesty, and I think a lot of other people have been as well. His channel has grown a lot. So I thought it'd be fun to have him come on the show and talk about that journey and see where he's at. And maybe we could have some fruitful dialogue about what divides and unites Protestants, Catholics, and the Orthodox. So Austin, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Trent. It's an honor and a privilege to get to kind of flip the seats here. I know I had you on my channel Gosh, it's almost probably been a year since we had you on. So it's super uh, exciting to be on your channel today. Yeah, I remember I was on your channel talking about the about the papacy. And so we were discussing that a bit. But yeah, so tell us a little more about the channel. Uh, How long have you been doing this? And briefly, you know, what is your journey and and growth been like uh, through this process, what you're doing? Yeah, so it's been a really winding journey. I'll say that when I set out with the channel, it wasn't called gospel simplicity. It had the very original name of Austin Suggs and it had the uh, direction of content of basically whatever came to my mind. So it's no surprise that took a while for it to grow because I didn't even know what the channel was about. So the channel started before I went to Moody Bible Institute where I just graduated from. And I guess that was a little over three years ago. It started as an opportunity to practice public speaking was really the main impetus for it. I had this desire to become a better teacher. I'd been given the opportunity to teach in a high school ministry at my church. And I thought, Hey, I've got some camera gear and I love doing Bible studies. Maybe I can just practice public speaking by making YouTube videos. And that was about the amount of thought that went into it at the start. Fast forward about a year or so into that journey, about a year and a half, I suppose. I one day sat down making my weekly let's chat video And I was reflecting on the experience I had of going to a Catholic Bible study with my uncle. He had not been in the church for most of his life, and he had some real tough times come on him. He was kind of drawn back to the church, and he was going to a Catholic church with his wife. He was really interested in it. And one day I got a call from him saying, hey, do you want to go to a Bible study with me? To which I said, of course, like this is an answer to prayer. He went to Moody Bible Institute, where Bible is our middle name. You've got it. Um, and then he tells me it's at 530 in the morning at a Catholic church. And I thought I really should listen more before I talk. <laughs> um, that would be, that'd be truly me. People always invite me to uh, men's groups and men's groups always meet at like six in the morning and I'm more yeah. of a night owl, but props to you for doing that. Yeah. So I ended up going and, you know, maybe a year afterwards it, I sat down and thought this would be an interesting video to make because I learned a lot there. I learned first of all, that there's Catholics that read the Bible. And that itself was a groundbreaking idea to me, Mm -hmm. uh, just like growing up in the state named after Mary and uh, Haven for English Catholics was its purpose in Maryland. But I didn't really know any Catholics that read the Bible. So I made that video. That video is my first video to really take off. And I got a lot of feedback on that from people saying, hey, it's cool that you went to this, but you should really go to a mass. If you want to understand Catholicism, You've got to go to a mass. That's the one that I felt really took off. Now, was this that you went just to mass or you went to Latin mass? <laughs> yes. So I went to a low Latin mass. By How is accident. it? Yeah. Um, I, I didn't know anything about the liturgy wars. I I just found the oh, church. Oh, no. I love, I know you call it a liturgy wars. I know because you've been around in Catholic circles for long enough to know what goes on with that. Because it's interesting if you get on the internet, there is a a vocal contingent of, you know, people identify as Catholic who uh, are are strongly inclined to the traditional Latin mass. And of course I have great respect for the traditional Latin mass. I'm more of a fan of the Eastern divine liturgy. And we'll get into that here later about your experiences with that. But that's just so interesting. Because I remember it's like Protestant goes to Latin mass and everyone's like, Oh my gosh, what's going on here. They just wanted to see that. And I think it just really took off from there. Yeah. So that video really did. And you can know the extent of my ignorance in that. So I went to this Latin mass at St. John Cantius, which just happened to be one of the closest Catholic churches to my school. And then I thought, oh, that was interesting. I should go to an English mass. So I did that. And being someone who makes videos, I was like, well, maybe I'll make a comparison. Having no idea this (laughs) whole debate existed. Totally. 
the comments that that had. But that that makes you a really interesting barometer because Catholics have disagreements about liturgical preferences, the the Latin mass, the the newer mass, the Novus Ordo. But for somebody who's just coming in just completely blind to it, it provides a kind of neat, honest perspective, I feel like, of the different liturgies because you have no reference frame. Yeah, I thought it was a fun video to make and I found it really interesting. It just so happened that the other church I went to was the Cathedral Church for Chicago. And so Mm -hmm. I got to see two beautiful experiences of Mass. I think I picked up on some things about kind of the type of people the two might draw and, you know, the most broad generalities, of course. And St. John Cantus being maybe a bit of an extreme example. I don't know. I know it's a very famous one, Mm -hmm. um, but I remember making comments about the fact that the people that came to Cantus came in buses because they all had like six to eight kids. And there was a lot of people where like having head coverings and just kind of a different demographic. But honestly, I, I enjoyed both of them. So it was fun to see it as an outsider. And I think that's one reason that the channel has had some growth of, I think people either A, think it's interesting to see kind of this outside perspective. And also right. I think I get a lot of people who come to my channel who see a bit of themselves and me, maybe they're a bit further down whatever line it is in their life. So maybe they reflect on their experience being a Protestant who investigated Catholicism and became Catholic or became Orthodox. Right. And I get comments all the time that they feel like they get to see their own journey kind of in right. slow motion. Now, you know, I don't know exactly where this will end up, but I think people enjoy it for that reason. And so after I started doing those things, I had a lot of brilliant people asking me questions I didn't know the answer to. And I thought, well, the best thing I could do is go find the smartest people I can and ask them these questions. So that's how I started doing interviews. Right. And so then after that, it seems like you wanted to do a spiritual and intellectual investigation looking into, you're starting off as a Protestant, someone who goes to Moody Bible Institute, but looking at Catholicism as well as orthodoxy. And so are you still kind of continuing that journey of assessing different theologies or, or how is that going? Yeah, so definitely. And I would say, I, I don't, there was part of me when you said you were someone that wanted to go do this. I think that's in part true. I feel like it also fell in my lap and there were times that I love it. And there were times that I thought, how did I get myself into this? My life was so much easier before I asked these questions. Uh, but with that aside, right. I, I've continued doing that. And I'll say it's been a real journey. I think at the very beginning of it, there's this real like heightened sense of existential angst as you become aware of all these different traditions, many of them making claims that have something to say that well, some fundamental things that you believe might be wrong. And of course, that's uncomfortable, right? Especially when those people are really bright and right. you don't have answers to all their questions. And so I feel like at the very beginning, there's this really heightened, oh my goodness, do I need to convert like tomorrow? And then I kind of continued looking into these things. And I feel like that sense has gone down slightly, but only because I've seen that many of these issues are really, really complicated. And I've right. kind of gone into a second layer of, okay, this isn't going to be something I figure out in like a month's time, nor do I think it is something I should figure out in a month. And also there was this point. So just for people who may not know my story as well, it was during this time I got engaged maybe a couple months into this um, and I'm getting married now in a week and a half. And so, yeah, yeah. And that's why I'm sitting in our half furnished apartment, um, getting all of my camera gear is in boxes, which is why I'm sitting here on a laptop. Uh, but it was during that time I also began talking the, through these things with Eliza, my fiance and soon to be wife, probably wife by the time this comes out. And I wanted it to be something that we could talk about together and we're long distance. And so I wanted to kind of bring her along. And so she's been in some of the videos that I've done. I've taken her to a Latin mass and a regular mass. I've taken her to a divine liturgy and I wanted it to be something, okay, we're starting marriage. This isn't, um, this is something worth investigating well. And in my opinion, I know people look at these things differently. It's something worth investigating together. And so that's kind of where I've been at now. And I'll also say, you know, I graduated two weeks ago. And so as much as what people see on YouTube is all my investigation of Catholicism and Orthodoxy, I've had a couple other things going on that kind of decreased the amount of time that I can spend just investigating this. But to give a short answer uh, to finish that very long answer. Yes. Right. It's something I'm still looking into it and I do enjoy it. Sure. And, and I guess 
originally when I was wanted to have, it's so funny. I, I sent you an invite, but it got lost in the email ether and then COVID happened. And uh, well, I think COVID was happening, but there was just so much stuff that was going on. Uh, I think what originally prompted me a while back, I wanted to have you come on the channel was you had put out two videos talking about, I think what was holding you back from Catholicism and from orthodoxy, because you did feel attracted to those traditions. And it was just interesting thing. What was, what was holding you back? And obviously your thoughts probably evolved or coalesced or or anything, you know, since then, from what I can recall, there were specific doctrinal concerns with Catholicism. Maybe it was the papacy or some Mariological uh, doctrines. And then the other, and then, so it was funny. I was going through that, listening to them. And I was thinking, oh man, I wonder what Austin's going to think about orthodoxy. Cause these are like really distinct Catholic things, but still not like, I really want this Protestant stuff instead, you know, cause there's a difference between I'm not sold on Catholic doctrine X versus I can't give up Protestant doctrine. Y. like those are yeah. two very different kinds of objections. And it seemed at least at that time for me, more like the former it's Catholic doctrine X. It's giving me trouble distinctly Catholic doctrine. And then for orthodoxy, I was really excited. I'm like, Oh, what does he think about that? And I found it interesting that one of your concerns was more that you didn't know if it was really like a part of your, tr- something that could be a part of your tradition. Cause it's, you're in the West, it's more of an Eastern thing. So yeah, I am curious to see what's, if anything has changed a lot from that time when I wanted you on <laughs> to come on the show. Yeah. If I, if I summarize it right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you summarized that well. I think I, I'm not sure I did a great job in that video particular, those particular videos, but sometimes when I talk about these things, I try to divide them between well, I describe as like head and heart issues mm-hmm. and because I try to recognize that I'm not just a brain on a stick. I don't have this kind of view from nowhere and operate solely as like, if I can line up all the right doctrines, as much as I'd like to say that, right. There's just, there's a part of you that maybe has this struggle on a different level that you would hope to subordinate under kind of the uh, more reasonable things. But so I think you've highlighted that well, that on the Catholic side, I highlighted maybe some key distinctive doctrines. And as I've gone through this process, I've tried to slowly refine my thinking because I interview so many great people from all these perspectives that I can often become while I'm sitting there with you, I hear all these great things and I'm sitting there with someone else who holds opposite opinions and they also sound really smart. And so I've been slowly working on some documents to try to see, okay, what are the key claims? And then what are the unique claims right. uh, to, to work through those things? So in Catholicism, I identified some of those in that video. In the Orthodox <laughs> video, I did bring up that idea of a sense of foreignness, just hmm. of like, do I have to become Russian to become Orthodox, which is a question that's certainly been answered in different ways. Um, that, okay, there's there's ways for Westerners to become Orthodox, clearly, um, but there's just that kind of instinctual sense for me at that time, at least that I highlighted. I also talked about, um, and this is something I get very many different answers on as well, uh, a sense of exclusivity within the Orthodox Church, not necessarily ethnically or nationally, but in terms of, is there salvation outside the Orthodox Church? I see. You'll get the, we can say where the church is, but not where it's not, or that kind of line, or there's people who um, hold much more tightly to only within the canonical bounds of the Orthodox church. And if it's the latter, that's just something that I personally struggle with, not only doctrinally, but that is part of it, but also just on an instinctual level of having met so many people that I would call brothers and sisters in Christ, Right. that that, that would be a really hard pill for me to swallow. So hopefully, yeah, that helps summarize it, but I'm happy to dive into any of these things and, and talk about whatever. Yeah. I mean, I, I have so many things that I'd be able to bring up here. Uh, one thing that's interesting we bring up with the Orthodox, I think sometimes when we're trying to understand what worldview we should belong to, uh, sometimes we can remove a worldview if we are, or a belief system or a religion, if we notice an essential, if, if we just instinctively say, uh, can say that uh, a part of that belief system is, is not true. And hopefully it's a union of head and heart because to write off a whole system you should be pretty strong, but that's how I feel about non-Christian religions and what they say about the resurrection of Christ. Sure. Cause obviously if they say Christ didn't rise, then I can't sign on board with them. Cause I'm pretty confident, you know, we did, uh, similar for me. That's why certain Protestant denominations, uh, I was talking about this 
I forget. Oh, I was talking about Cameron Bertuzzi actually hmm. recently. That video should air soon. And I told him during my conversion experience from being a mere Christian to being Catholic, there were certain denominations right off the bat. I knew well, I can't belong to this because I'm positive this denomination is wrong on baptism or this denomination is wrong on eternal security. And so, mm-hmm. the, and so it starts to fall off the board if there's, and so for me, I also hold the view. I don't hold the view on the possibility of salvation for non-Christians. I would be a, a hopeful inclusivist, I guess might be a, a term. So I do believe it is possible and should not be confused with probable, but possible for those who are not Catholic or not Christian to be saved. Uh, and that's essentially what the church teaches in, in Vatican II uh, documents like that. So I'd be in your same shoes that if there was a, a denomination where it was hard and fast, unless you are a publicly committed member of this denomination, you're not going to heaven. I, I, it's something I would have a very hard time wrapping. My, I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't be able to accept that, that either from what I know about God's justice, his love, fairness, um, things like that. So... Is there, is there any doctrine, I guess, within Catholicism? I mean, it doesn't sound like there's one that rises to that level of, yeah, that's false. Maybe there are just some you're at, I'm not really sold on that. You see how the difference would be between, I, I have a really bad feeling this is just not true versus it could be true, but I'm not sold on it. Are there, I mean, maybe are, are there doctrines like that that go between those two ways of looking at it? Yeah, and I think that's a great way of putting it. And I think that's the reason why, for instance, I get a lot of people that will tell me that because of my videos, they've become Catholic. And I'm at a place where, honestly, that doesn't particularly bother me. Mm -hmm. And because of the way that I see it of, I haven't been sold on certain things, Mm -hmm. right? Like, And I look at it in terms of if you take that mere Christianity kind of view that you're talking about, the, the reason I'm Protestant, I would say, is that it, in the vein of Protestantism that I see myself in would be it's just a smaller set of doctrines that I'm holding to as a whole. Um, and I know that might have problems, and I'm happy to get into that. Sure. But I would say in, in those core things, we, I would share those in common with Catholicism. And in the points that differ, while I haven't been sold on them, I don't see them as things that are deeply troubling to me. Now that might be deeply troubling to some of my Protestant friends and that's sure. fine enough. Right. But that's the way that I look at it um, right now. And yeah, so I think you summarized that well. Yeah. I, I love this because so I'm working on a book right now about the parallels between uh, when Catholics and Protestants dialogue with each other and when Christians and atheists dialogue with each other. I've heard you talk about this a bit. I'm excited to hear more. Well, I'm excited to send you, I'll send you a copy. I'm looking for Protestants to send a copy of the book to before it goes to print, but actually before when I'm done with the rough draft, Uh, because I want Protestant buy-in. They may not agree with all the conclusions, but I want to make sure I treat Protestantism fairly in this regard, because I've noticed these parallels, even what you describe here, because I can imagine you and an atheist talking and an atheist may say something like this. Look, Austin, you're Christian. I'm an atheist. I actually agree with you about a lot of things like the physical world exists. There's morality, human beings matter. uh, We, we ought to do good to one another. We should try to explain things. I agree with you on a lot of things, but I'm just not sold on this other stuff you want to bring in, like the existence of God, the inspiration of the Bible. So I agree with you on some things, but I'm just not quite sold on this other stuff. And there's smart people on both sides of the issue. And it's hard for me to, uh, to work through it. That's where I see sometimes the parallel. I feel like uh, when atheists and Christians dialogue, it's we agree on physical reality exists. Uh, The question is, do we need more to explain that? And sometimes I feel like Protestants and Catholics, we agree on something like scripture, for example, is, is inspired or something like that. But the question is, do we need more in this system? And, you know, I'm not quite sold on all the other stuff you're you're bringing in that that has a lot, you know, has a lot with it where my concern lies. And, uh, and honestly, as somebody who would want every person to be in full communion with Christ church, I would be concerned about uh, treating Protestantism as if it is just an assumed starting point. Like, it's like, well, I just start here and I have these beliefs 
should I add the Catholic beliefs to them? I really do believe everybody has to say, okay, can I justify my starting beliefs? So for me, like in my conversion experience, I, st- I just looked at the arguments, say, okay, God exists. Historically, Jesus rose from the dead. And then the question is like, okay, well, where do I go from there? Like, I don't, and this is what I mentioned with Cameron. I don't think that there, there's kind of a jump from just like, hey, there's God and he raised Jesus from the dead to suddenly now what's my authority? Is it this canon of scripture? Is it scripture and tradition? Or is it scripture, tradition, and a magisterium? Uh, and I don't mean to, to ramble too much. We, we can go back and forth. But I would be concerned to say, okay, you know, I'm definitely confident about Protestantism, at least. It's, there's nothing, you know, I believe in all the things that it has. Should I add stuff to it? I always think the mirror has to be held up to say, it's kind of like when you interview people about the papacy. And they say, well, look at the, you know, is, isn't it attested here? And, you know, does this Bible verse really show the papacy? Like, Does the evidence stack up for it? The argument that I'm trying to put forward now more in my dialogues, it would not be so much, hey, is there, can you prove Catholicism from the Bible and history? I think more interesting question is, if you use the Bible and history, is there more evidence for the Catholic view of authority or for the Protestant view? Like, so it could even still be below 50% confidence. I'm just wondering which has more than the other. That's what I'm pl- toying around with and playing around with now, I guess not to play. This is, these are important questions, but I rambled. Yeah. I didn't mean to do that, but your thoughts. Yeah. I, I think I have a lot of thoughts and I, I heard you talk about this a little bit. So I was wondering if it would come up and I, I'm glad it did. Cause I think it's an interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. I think I agree with you in, in part, I think in like ideal so- situation, I think we would kind of start, carte blanche, right? Or tabula rasa there, right? right? And we set out and say, okay, I've been convinced of this proposition. Jesus rose from the dead um, and he, he's God. Okay. Even if like that, that's all you've got. And then, okay, now which uh, authority claim am I going to adhere to? Is, is the Catholic church, is the Protestant church, Orthodox church, et cetera. Mm-hmm. I, I actually like that. And as an intellectual experiment, I think that's really good. I think my struggle with it is how that plays out in real life. Mm-hmm. Because I, I, that's not exactly how I came to these beliefs, even sure. if maybe I'd like to say that's how I did, right? That I sat one, down one day and I just you know, looked at all of the, the history and said, this is true. Now I, I have done investigation into the resurrection and right. I'm very convinced of the... But the, were, were, you Christ, were you raised Christian? I was, mm-hmm. yes. And so while I did have an experience of pushing away and then it was actually through a lot of natural theology that kind of brought me back mm-hmm. in high school in part, um, I, I was raised in a Protestant home. And so that's where I found myself. And so I think when I first started investigating these things, I tried to do that a bit to kind of remove myself. And one week I'd be at a Catholic church. One week I'd be at an Orthodox church. One week I'd be at a Protestant church, just trying to really say like, okay, if I re- pulled myself out of this, And then I found just on a personal level, and this could just be my own wiring, that I found that difficult for my spiritual life to kind of be hopping around so much. And I thought, oh, this isn't, this isn't good for me. So I'm going to plant myself in what I know and try to continue investigating these things. Even if when I go to a maybe contemporary non-denominational service, there's things I might not agree with. I found, okay, I am not a completely detached person. Like I have been raised and formed within a tradition of faith. And so I, I need to be, have some grounding while I investigate these things so that my spiritual life doesn't become completely hindered because of an intellectual pursuit. Does that make sense? No, it absolutely does. If someone just treats it as just like an intellectual puzzle and that's just all they're doing and they're neglecting their prayer life, they're neglecting community. I think that that can really be problematic. What I'm concerned about sometimes in, and it's so interesting to see this. I also mentioned this to Cameron as well. It's more often that, and because Cameron is in kind of this journey as well, the Caption Christianity channel, because he's interviewing people and he's very open to Catholicism, um, possibly, you know, well, he has said it's possible. It's true. I mean, a lot of things yeah. possible, but he, he sees it as a legitimate possibility. Uh, and so, uh, shoot, where was I? Where was I going with this? Uh, well, to bring it back, okay, my, my concern might be something. So I understand that. I guess the other thing I'd be concerned about, and oh, sorry, here's what it was. Uh, I, I have noticed 
it's more common for me to find Protestants who are willing to publicly talk about their investigation of Catholicism than it is to find a Catholic who, or, or an Orthodox to publicly discuss their investigation of Protestantism. And I've always found that to be just kind of interesting. I don't know if within Protestantism, because there are so many different denominations one can be a part of, maybe it's just more accepted to have that spirit of inquiry. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I, you know, I just don't find too many people like Catholic YouTuber, hey, I'm going to these Protestant churches and I'm, I'm going to investigate it. You, you, know, you, don't, you don't find that as much as compared to Protestants who investigate things or investigate Catholicism. Do you notice yeah, that? Yeah, and I, I think you hit on the idea there about how Protestants maybe view denominations. Because, for instance, I grew up in a non-denominational church, but had I grown up Presbyterian, it wouldn't, and you know, maybe a hundred years ago, it would, but I don't think now would be that uh, momentous of a thing for me to say, actually, you know what, I think I might be more of a Reformed Baptist. And my Protestant friends wouldn't think that's a big deal. They might want to have some conversation about infant baptism or something like that, but there's less. So I think the denomination is seen as almost not entirely separate, but we have these core truths, which I think many people talk about fairly of you guys really struggle to to determine what exactly those are, which is a a great conversation. Well, Well, you know, that's funny in about five hours from now, I'm going to have a discussion with two Protestants, an Anglican and a Calvinist on this very question. Can Protestants coherently agree on what are the core doctrines of Christianity or, or Protestantism? Because I, I think that that's, that's and, I, and I'm really excited to talk about it with an Anglican and a Calvinist, a low church Calvinist, yeah. which I think will make it very evident there's that lack of agreement. Yeah. And I think it's a, a great, I, I'm excited. Let me know when it comes out. I'll have to watch it. Sure. Um, but where was I going with this? Oh yes. So being formed for instance, in a place like Moody, right. Mm-hmm. I, I went to Moody Bible Institute, got a theology degree there. It's explicitly interdenominational. So Moody has a statement of faith that uh, students have to agree to, but the professors come from, I have had, you know, like high church Anglicans, low church Baptists. Mm -hmm. Um, Do we have any, probably some Presbyterians all over. And then within the student body on a Sunday morning, students go to probably hundreds of different churches within probably dozens of denominations or so. Right. And it's just normal. So at least it's normal to my experience. Right. And I think for that reason, for a Protestant to say, oh, I'm investigating Catholicism or Orthodoxy, well, it has had people wonder if I'm completely going off the rails at Moody, like people have yeah. asked me that. There is also this understanding of, well, you still fundamentally believe the gospel, right? Oh, so you might add some extra trappings on that, which I don't think is a quite fair understanding of Catholicism or Orthodoxy. I think to make that conversion is to say something profoundly different about denominations. But within a Protestant worldview, how we think about denominations, they're kind of secondary to this core idea of the gospel. So that's maybe one reason why. Yeah. Could somebody go to Moody and sign the statement of faith? Could a, could a cat, I haven't looked at the statement of faith in a while. Uh, could it, I wonder if a Catholic could, cause oh, they're all, a lot of them are different. If a Catholic could sign that and, and attend there, or if it would be contradictory. I sparked no small amount of controversy, at least within my channel by screenshotting the things that I had to sign and asking if a Catholic could sign it. Some people interpret it wrongly as me saying like, I am a Catholic except for having to sign this. And so I think that was one reason for so many Mm. of the comments. I'm not sure would be the final answer. I think being, to me, it wouldn't feel completely intellectually honest given a couple of the ways they say things, but it does come down to, which is another thing we could talk about, how you interpret those statements. So what right. do they mean when they say justification by faith? Because if we can word it just like the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification, maybe we can get it there. Well, it reminds uh, me of when the, the Catholic philosopher Francis Beckwith, uh, now he converted to Catholicism, oh gosh, I want to say something like 20 years ago. Uh, he And he used to be not only an evangelical, he was the president of the evangelical theological society. Mm. And so he, when he converted to Catholicism in order to avoid uh, uh, discomfort among people, he resigned from being president of ETS. But I think he said that in good conscience, he could have signed the ETS statement of faith, 
that it wasn't worded so narrowly. It's like if you put something like, we affirm that only a 66 book canon of scripture is inspired in here. Like if you there, I've seen statements of faith that are worded that way. That's clear to keep Catholics and Orthodox out the door. But I think some people at the time said, if an open theist can be in the ETS, like why can't a Catholic be involved here? It's um, because even within Protestantism, it's so funny. It's like, there are going to be people who are, you know, like if you go to Moody, I don't know. It's when you go there. So you're, you're an alum now. Uh, does the statement of faith, could a, could a universalist go to Moody? That's a great question. I don't think a universalist could, and there's actually some very interesting things that are very specific. So like mm. they affirm a traditional view of marriage within the statement of faith, mm-hmm. um, which is, I think more specific than some of the other things, not that I disagree with it, but I, I think that sticking points for a Catholic on mm. Moody's statement of faith regard the way they talked about the Bible. I think they might've used the soul infallible. I don't remember if they mm. said it that way. Um, and then the way they were justification by faith was very much like a reformation way of saying it. Right. Um, but yeah, to your point though, I, I do think that's an interesting dynamic and I don't know if you've had him on your channel or if you know of him, but uh, Dr. Matthew Thomas, he's a mm. Catholic convert and he has that same story of he taught at Regent or he still teaches at Regent converted uh, while he was teaching there and said, I can still in good faith sign this. Now they have more of an Anglican influence there. So it might already be a bit closer in that way, right. um, but it, it is intriguing. Yeah. So another point that I want to raise just in your journey, as you you've looked at Catholic churches and the Orthodox, and I think also one has to keep Protestantism I understand the need for a spiritual home base. So you're not totally disconnected from God, but I also worry a little bit about, especially someone in your position and others who feel like they have a mountain of data to, to research before they, before they can make a decision that you can have a kind of analysis paralysis. It's like, here's all these smart people on either side. Who am I to break the, break the tie between them? It's like, you're, it'd be like, if you were going out trying to buy a house and you're looking and you're looking and it's just so hard, like it's a big commitment. And sometimes you want to just get back home to your apartment where you're at now. At least you can go here and you can relax and be at home. Maybe you'll find a good house out there. Maybe you aren't, but at least you have your apartment right here. I would worry about, not that Protestantism is an unfurnished apartment. Well, some forms of Protestantism, low church that have hardly any images. It feels like an unfurnished apartment to me, frankly. Um, that it kind of becomes that from being a place to make sure you're still connected with God to being a refuge from analysis paralysis where someone just remain remains there because they cannot decide amongst other options. I, because for me, what one thing that impelled me was, well, I, I mean, I started reading the Bible. You could call me, have called me Protestant, but I felt like, wow, uh, the authority that's embedded here, I don't see any evidence to, I don't see sufficient evidence to prop it up as the authority. I need to find something else. So it's more like my house is burning down and I got to go get into another one. So I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it does. And I think again, kind of experientially, I can resonate with that idea of even if it's not what I'm trying to do at times that yeah, going back to a Protestant church can at times feel like a refuge from the analysis paralysis. And that's something that I I am trying to work on now. Like I said, it took me longer than I would have liked to really start trying to systematize some of this data. And I'm not going to be the guy like Cameron who has going to have like a Bayesian analysis on this um, (laughs) fascinating approach to it. And I just, and most people, I think most people just try to say, okay, inference to the best explanation what what view ex, what view explains a lot and has the fewest problems might be a way and to i think that's it. a really helpful way of looking at it because I'll, I'll say when i started this i had very much a mindset of okay i'm going to go out and find out which one is true no no air gaps in this reasoning like i'll be a hundred percent and that's when i'll make whatever decision I've gotten to the place now where I really do see it as more of a, a probability type of thing, which I know might make some people uncomfortable. I get comments and emails all the time that like, I've proven without a shadow of a doubt that Catholicism or Orthodoxy is true. And I always kind of wonder like, how, like, what are the mechanics of that proof? Yeah. But in any case, I do think it's a matter of probability. And I'll say there's 
things that I remember specifically from my interviews, and you know this, when you interview a lot of people, you're, you're thinking about your next question. Sure. So much of it, you know, you're going on to the next one, maybe that day or the next day. You, you only remember so much. But one thing I specifically remember from my interview with you that has left an impression is you asked me, and I still don't know I have the exact answer, but I think it's a high priority question of what would it take? Because I think that's a question that we don't often ask. It's right. well, when it when I'm when I've determined it's true, when I'm right. convinced. Um, but but what is that bar? And it's a difficult thing to put your finger on, but I think it's an important question to start with. And I'll say I've taken different approaches at early on, and I was actually looking at this before our interview just for fun. Yeah. I had copy and pasted a list of the 255 Catholic dogmas and color coded it according to my <laughs> level of like, okay. Where, like where did you get those friend. from like Ludwig Ott or I'm curious. I have where no the, idea. The, I, okay. So you've got a list. Yeah. It's okay. Go ahead. And you know, for whatever, and I, I kind of look, took it that way mm-hmm. and realized this is not functional. Like the odds of me going through all of these right. and proving them all. And so I've tried to hone in on the question of authority because I do think it is the question, right? That it, it, you pick that, you kind of see the other dominoes fall and more picking a system rather than trying to individually align all the doctrines, even though the latter, I think it says something about my Protestant upbringing that my first instinct is, okay, let's go doctrine by doctrine by doctrine. And maybe a bit about modern individualism of uh, I'll see if I can prove each of these uh, right. rather than which house do I want to live in. Um, and that is something I think about as well, um, not to ramble too many on different You're tracks fine. here, but that idea now that I, I am getting married and you know thinking about kids and everything like that down the line, it's this question not only of which is intellectually true, but like where can I go and grow in faith myself mm-hmm. and my soon-to-be wife and kids, Lord willing, like that's a question that presses on me a bit more now too than I think than when I started asking these. Okay. So, and that's interesting because I think if you look at the teachings, you can do like one pass is, you know, you, you have a standard, like what standard do I use to determine if, if a denomination is true or an authority structure is true and you can do one pass to say, okay, is anything in this false? And then that would be disqualifying, but you might just get to the point, well, is it all true or is most of it, at least I can have certainty that it's true. I don't think there's anything wrong with that particular approach. So I guess next two questions, looking at just Catholicism and Protestantism, the Orthodox might pop its head in here. I I don't know. Um, Well, I guess what would you see as being the biggest problems with the Catholic view of authority and the biggest problems with the Protestant view of authority? that, that still have, you still have to grapple with. Yeah. So for the process or for the Catholic view of authority, we'll start there. I would say the papacy is the, the biggest question. And sure. I think in many ways, the question, because again, I think if you solve that one or solve, right, whatever we want to use that word to mean here. Right. Um, I, I think that kind of is the linchpin uh, mm-hmm. of the argument. And so for me, that question has become not just, is this a crazy idea, which is where it started, right? A Pope, like that's uh, like, that's not in the Bible to seeing, okay, there's good arguments for these. Are are the arguments convincing? And that's the the mode of thought I've been working with. I do think it's interesting the way you put it up. It doesn't even have to be greater than 50%. Is it just better than the other? Right. Which is something worth grappling with. But at least so far I've been asking, am I convinced of the papacy. Um, and while I've seen arguments that I think raise its credibility significantly, mm-hmm. I haven't gotten to the point where I think specifically on more biblical grounds, which is getting sure. to that, which arbiter are we going to use? Um, sure. That I, I've been convinced that, okay, this is the, the God ordained way. I have become convinced that there's a primacy for Peter, mm-hmm. um, that he has a special role there. And um, yeah, I just, I guess. I haven't gotten from there to kind of like a a Vatican one definition of papal infallibility, allowing for doctrinal development, which I I think is something we all should affirm for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. On the Protestant side, the biggest problems with it, I think are that lack of consensus, right? So if the Bible is our authority, it can become difficult functionally um, to see how that works out given the problem of interpretation. 
I think it can be overplayed. Um, I think sometimes the problem of interpretation can be argued against in such a way that um, Catholics wouldn't want to apply that to their own teaching per se, right. maybe um, in an inverse of the way that Protestants argue like atheists. Um, but I, I do think it can be problematic in the sense of, okay, if the Bible is our authority, whose interpretation or how do we get to some type of consensus where this works without endless division? So I, I think the question of unity um, is probably the biggest problem with the Protestant view of authority, even though I want to be careful to say that I think sola scriptura is maybe caricaturized or poorly understood by Protestants um, to mm. be something that's a bit too simplistic. Right. But nevertheless, I do think that would be the place I would point to for a problem. So th that's interesting there. Um, how would orthodoxy fit into this? Because they might say, well, we don't have a Pope, but we still have we, under, we recognize Peter is the first among equals, but we have sacred tradition. Uh, we have um, these other, sorry, I got a call on the other line, even though I set my computer to uh, do not disturb. Uh, hopefully my wife's all right. I'm sure she's fine. Uh, someone might try to jump in and say, well, if the papacy is just your, your main problem, where would orthodoxy? Because for me personally, when I want to share my, my Catholic faith with others or help people to understand the papacy, I feel like the papacy can't get off the ground unless someone is already convinced sola scriptura is false and there's some notion of apostolic succession. So like for me, I feel like it would be hard to wrap one's head around. the. In fact, that's why I do a lot of different debates and dialogues on these issues but I try not to do debates where I'm too far apart from the other person. Like I wouldn't debate a Jehovah's witness on whether Christ had a divine and a human will, right? Because we're right. so far apart already on who Jesus is. It wouldn't be a very fruitful discussion. In much the same way, I'm not going to debate with a, I won't debate a Protestant on whether Mary was assumed bodily uh, into heaven because we're, we're so far apart on the, on the question of how to answer whether that, that question that we have to really, be closer. And I think it's similar with, with the papacy. Uh, so for me, to, for the papacy to make sense, if like, if you believe, well, I can't hold a sola scriptura, I don't, it's contradictory or I don't see the evidence for it. And I do see good evidence. The authority of the apostles continued on and successors that seems to open the door more to orthodoxy or a kind of Anglicanism. Um, what do you think of that? somewhere middle ground, which would be between non-denominational Protestantism and Catholicism, this kind of orthodoxy or possibly Anglicanism. How does that fit into the equation? Yeah, I guess I'm trying to decide whether to take those in turn or whether to just kind of lump them together. But I think mm -hmm. for orthodoxy, I think it is attractive for many Protestants for this very reason, mm -hmm. um, that it's not Catholicism for a lot of people is a, a very solid point for orthodoxy for better or worse there. Um, but I, I would say that my struggle with orthodoxy is if I'm making that jump to some type of magisterial authority, sure, I'd really want it to kind of continue in a more robust way than I see it continuing in the Orthodox church. So for go, me, go big, go big or go home. Yeah, I, I guess. Now that's not to say that there's not things I love about the Orthodox church. In fact, on right. when I think more on that spiritual level of, you know, where is it? that I can just seek Christ. Um, I haven't gotten to talk to Orthodox monks and such like the, the Jesus prayer, things like that. Like, I think there's such a vibrant spiritual life there. Um, but I do worry a bit and this will get me in trouble, but half the things I say do on these grounds. Um, me too. It's uh, okay. There's this sense of if I'm going to make that jump, it feels like a half step at times in terms of magisterial authority, because I, I think the idea of a magisterium and a Pope is actually like a really great idea. Like that, that functions well, theoretically, as, as Cameron would say, there's a high prior probability if, uh, which would be the Bayesian way to look at it, that if God were not going to restrict revelation to the Bible alone or sola scriptura, well, there's revelation outside the Bible, revelation. You, everyone knows what I mean. If sola scriptura is not the means God chose by public revelation, it sounds like you're saying a more robust magisterium would make sense, or there's like a higher prior probability than just something that's kind of half in half out, uh, between the two of rejecting soul scriptura, but not giving a really suitable authority 
like a living teaching office in its place. Yeah. And that's a great way of putting it. And Cameron is much better versed in philosophy than I am. So I'm grateful <laughs> for his higher prior probability uh, paradigm there. <laughs> yeah. So I guess for me, and I guess my um, uh, exhortation or recommendation for you or for others, this is something I want to explore too, to help look at the debate from different ways is I might say, all right, you know, I, I have a problem. Here's the Vatican one definition of the papacy. Can I use the Bible and church history to get there? And it's like, well, I get somewhere, as people will say, but I'm not fully there. And my exercise would be, well, why don't you take the Chicago statement of inerrancy or Moody's statement about, you know, um, biblical, you know, about the Bible, like a Protestant or the Westminster Confession of Faiths or the London Baptist Confession about scripture, uh, when it says, uh, all the weird to believe are found in these books, uh, and uh, anyone learned and unlearned can arrive to the the basic. I, I forget how it's how it's phrased in Westminster. Sure. And I guess my encouragement people who would say, "Well, I've done the Bible and history. I can't get to Vatican One papacy. Can you get to Westminster Confession on Scripture or London Baptist? Like with the robust terms, uh, this particular canon inspired. Every one book is inspired." inerrant, the only infallible rule of faith. Like I would worry that it's like with Catholicism, it's like you got this big robust target and it's easy to, you know, poke holes when you make a lot of claims, right? It's like, if you make a lot of claims, you know, it's like, okay, it's easy to start poking holes in them. If you don't, if you're more modest, you know, it's easier. My concern though, is that Protestantism may appear modest at first, but actually has somewhat robust authority claims. And I would just ask people yourself and others, do the same exercise. Can you get Bible and history, not just to a vague idea of Protestantism, but to a particular articulation of Protestant authority that if it's the one you live by, you live by, whether it's Westminster, London Baptist, whatever it may be. If you can't get to the papacy that way, can you get to these Protest- this Protestant articulation of authority? And I guess, like I said to you earlier, if not, is there one you get closer to? That, that's what I, I don't know if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. And I, I think this would be a fascinating area for your book. It, it seems to overlap with the idea of Protestants arguing like atheists, because I think the Protestant instinct on that is to say, okay, if I can't get to the Catholic claim, then then that's a problem, right? Because as a Catholic, I have to get there. If I can't get to the Protestant claim, well, I have this paradigm of Semper Reformandi, like reformed and always reforming. I can maybe just make this one a little better. And <laughs> I... I see the problems with that. Um, right. And I see how that can create so many denominations. And so I think it's something worth thinking about. I, I think that is maybe the, the knee jerk Protestant reaction of, well, I don't like, if I can't get to 1689, I can just remain Protestant and kind of tweak that understanding. Um, or if I can't get to um, the Westminster confession, I can get to that and tweak it. Now yeah. I know this is an area um, that, that Gavin Ortland has been, uh, someone that we've both talked with mm-hmm. trying to correct a bit within Protestantism to say that there is authority structures within Pro- the Protestant church. Like it's not just, you're doing it all by yourself. Um, and, and I think that's a good idealistic goal for Protestantism, but I think just the, the theological impulse or the, the cultural impulse of Protestantism is to do more of the, the former of just saying, if I can't get there, well, maybe I can find what is the best I can get to. Um, and so I think also for me, the question would be not only where can I get to, but is that a good system of being able to say I can get here and then either just fall back to what seems like this lowest common denominator or like, do I have the right to tweak things? Well, it reminds me a little bit of like a Christian and an atheist talking and a Christian will say, well, you should believe God exists because, you know, you can't explain where the universe came from or why we have these moral duties to one another in an atheistic universe you know, even if you don't, aren't fully on board with Christianity, uh, atheism itself, denying the existence of God, you're left with these peculiar facts about the universe that remain unexplained. And I think a Christian would have a hard time if an atheist said, well, you know, maybe I don't have a full explanation for it, but I can just start with morality exists, even if I can't fully explain it, and I can come up with a moral system, even if I don't need Christianity to to bolster it, I'll just start with that as a given and move forward and see what happens. It sort of reminds me with some Protestants who might say, 
well, even if I can't explain how I can have certainty that this is the canon of scripture, these books are inspired, they are inerrant, they are the sole infallible rule of faith. I can, you know, it's still a find, I can just make it a brute fact that I just start from and work out in the same way. I see a parallel there of wanting to have, you know, at the very least, here's a foundation I can start with, even if I can't fully explain it, because I can get some traction with it. And I would just say, look, eventually the bill is going to come due of explaining this foundation of authority, because if you don't, things will start to get undermined. And I think we do see this in Protestantism with, I mean, it's funny when I, I was preparing for my dialogue later tonight, you know, saying, you know, and Father James, who's an Anglican, the person one of the people I'll be talking to, was saying, well, well, no, you know, maybe Protestants don't agree, but, but Anglicans agree. We do have doctrinal agreement. And I think, well, yeah, until a significant portion of you say, well, no, marriage can be two men or two women. And so you're Episcopalians that get excised. It's like, yeah, you have agreement with Protestantism until there is disagreement. And then you just have another church that pops up. So I don't know. Those are, I guess those are my thoughts on that. If that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely does make sense. And I think it's a a great thing to be thinking about. And I I think there are parallels there. Um, I I think maybe my best answer is it's something I need to think through more. And I'll say I'm excited to hopefully have a bit more margin to think about these things. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a possibility I'll be writing a book in the next year um, about looking into these things, which would be an awesome opportunity to be able to sit and have some more focused opportunity to, to think about these things. But I, I think that that is worth, um, worth pondering deeply. And I, I'm looking forward to your book coming out. Yeah. I think I'll say, I, I, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. Well, I was, I was just going to, I was just, <laughs> James, go for it. You, oh, yeah. you owe me a non-specific brand of cola. Um, yeah, I, I guess my advice when I'm just seeing people, and to, to parallel the atheist Protestant um, comparison here is to resist the temptation to keep a treasured part of reality through a brute fact assertion without going deeper. So whether it's an atheist who just takes the existence of the universe and moral laws and other things that seem to cry out for an external explanation saying, well, your external explanation has some dicey elements to it. I'll take, I'm just going to keep it as a brute fact. I feel the same way about the essential elements of the Protestant view of authority at the very least. Yeah. I keep, um, keep digging that, that to me is, I think, you know, it's kind of funny, right? It's like when we want to evangelize people, uh, how do you get people to believe in the good news of the gospel? I find in the modern world, it's very difficult to get people to believe in the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they are not convicted of the bad news of sin. That's why it's called good news, right? You live in a world, at least in the pagan world, 2000 years ago, pagans were depressed about the afterlife. You die, you go to an underworld, it's depressing. There's, life was bad news and the gospel was real good news. Nowadays, sin, death, there's not as much bad news to people. And so to get them to see, no, what you have right now, there's something fundamentally broken about it that's really problematic. I don't see it as creating the impetus. So whether that is for an atheist to consider the gospel, I think you, that there has to be a conviction of bad news before good news. I think this similar dynamic arises for me with Catholicism and Protestantism that sometimes I think Catholics share the faith. Like look at, and I think they are beautiful. The teaching of purgatory is beautiful. Uh, the communion of saints, uh, when you, there's a lot of beautiful elements but I don't think it will be like, I think the good news of Catholicism doesn't create that impetus to avoid analysis paralysis unless one is constantly nagged by a bad news that there is something eating away at the foundations of Protestantism that makes it not a safe position to hold. So I, I guess that's my message for you and for other Protestants who are out searching. Look, I have good news to, to share. And I, and I think the, the introspection would be, would be important. So I'll end it there. I want you to have last words and put your thoughts together, all that. Yeah, I, I think that's helpful. I think the image that you gave of, or I'll put it as a question, I guess, is Protestantism that safe apartment to find respite in from the, the home buying search. 
Um, or is it a place that's on fire that really <laughs> gives you an impetus to find that house? Um, I, I agree with that. And I think maybe the only thing I'd say to Protestants who are in similar shoes to me is that you know, buying a house, or in this case, something much more important, finding an ecclesial home, um, all, while very important, is important enough to not rush as well. Um, I just worry that I, I think that impetus is a good thing. Um, I know having sat in my channel only for a year and a half of doing these things, we've gotten messages from people who have in that time period become Catholic, left the Catholic church, become Orthodox, you know, become Lutheran. Well, I think that the analogy here, similar to what you're going through, how long were you engaged? I was engaged for 15 months. Right. So I think it's like, if you're investigating these claims, it's like, you don't want to be the person who gets married next week but you also shouldn't wait 10 years to get married because you got to look at every single thing. It's about finding that kind of balance. Yeah, I think that is a good analogy um, because I do think it's very fair. I've heard people, and I think they're mainly scholars who, I don't know if they have tenure and just have like a whole lot of time, but when they describe <laughs> how someone should go through this, it's, yeah, you should go kind of period by period, you know, the anti-Nicene, the Nicene, the post-Nicene fathers and, and see which one makes the most sense. And I'm thinking like, to do this on like a realistic level, uh, right. like great inquiry, like this would take a lifetime. Um, and right. I, I don't want to do that either. Um, I don't want to set like a false clock on it. Like in six months, I'll have an answer because that feels kind of arbitrary. Right. Um, but I, I do hear you on that as well. And I, I, that's the first time I've heard someone use engagement as a um, metaphor for that, but I, I think it's a really good one. I don't want Protestants people, if their relationship with Protestantism is like, Hey, we've been living together for so long, might as well get married. It's like, no, there might be other, there might be other options out there. Don't just, don't just slide into it. <laughs> Basically it should be something more of, of having that discernment, but I think you're, you're right. And that's why I think you're a good model for this, for other people to look at that. Yeah. You don't want to prematurely jump into changing your entire worldview, but you want to avoid taking so long and looking at everything that you end up sliding into uh, a belief system you just happen to have grown up in or have had for a long time. Yeah. Yep. I, I would agree with that. And I'll say, I've also had conversations um, with people of the, the investigation period mm -hmm. is not the most comfortable in a lot of ways. And it's not the one I want to be in forever. And so I agree. I, I don't want to default there. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to just resolve the tension as quick as I can to make that kind of dread go away. Um, but I do think that again, and as I think about getting married and having a family one day, like I, I would like to be a man of a tradition, you know, to, to set yeah. down roots there um, and not make this a forever, like, you know, balancing the scales, um, but seeing, okay, this, this has the, the highest probability. I, I think this is true given my, you know, limitedness. Um, but, but this is what I'm going to live into. I wouldn't say I, I feel that level of confidence with, with any tradition right now. Um, but I'll also say, as I said uh, earlier that I, I have tried to make myself not just like in this no man's land, but in the meantime, to continue kind of tending to my soul, if you will, Sure. because I think hanging out in that no man's land for too long, at least for me, I don't find spiritually productive. No, I, th I think that that is, that that's fair. Um, but I think you're also in a great position that you can also continue to reap spiritual benefits from attending mass or divine liturgy yeah. or other things like that. So yeah, keep us, keep us informed. And I am excited for where the channel goes and we'll be praying for your, your spiritual journey, Austin. Awesome. Thanks Trent. And let me know when the book comes out and maybe I can have you on to chat about it. Oh yeah, that would be great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'm guessing just for people to check you out, they should just go to gospel simplicity on YouTube. Yep. Gospel simplicity. That's where you find me. Or if you want to go to gospel you'll find all my stuff there as well. If you try to reach me in the next couple of weeks, I will be otherwise indisposed. I, I think that that's there when you're, when you're searching, when you have found it, you should take some time with your beloved that applies to your spouse. And then if you discern your final faith tradition, maybe it's Catholicism, maybe not. We'll see. Take some time, private time with beloved as well. So I wish mm -hmm. you the best of luck. Enjoy. My advice for you is this. Once you guys are newlyweds, 
uh, stay out late and go out to dinner a lot. Enjoy that. Because when you have kids, that's the end of that. So just saying, (laughs) (laughs) or it's not the end of it. Suddenly you're a victim of the baby, the babysitter's racket. I mean, club. Uh, So (laughs) that's what we remember. We were like, oh man, we should have gone out more before we had kids. Well, thank you so much. Everybody check out gospel simplicity. Austin, thanks for coming on the council of Trent today. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you guys so much. And by the way, just a reminder that if you want access, everyone who is a patron of uh, Council of Trent gets access to my arguing about abortion course at the School of Apologetics. So go to trendhornpodcast.com if you want your free copy of that. Thank you guys so much. I hope you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trendhornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.